All right, we're going to be talking about uh, wives, and I've also included the husbands in today because next week is anniversary Sunday, and uh, and the the verses following uh, husbands, which it starts in verse nine, is a great great passage to go right into um, anniversary Sunday. So I thought, you know what? I'm just going to combine it. I'll beat up on both in the same day. Let them go talk about each other on the way home. And life is good. Amen and amen. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. And uh, as we start out in this, this passage is just like, boom. Wives, be submissive to your husbands. Amen. <laughs> See, guys, I threw it out there and you should have snatched up on that one and said amen. But I realize you got to go home and live with them. So I understand the restraining there. Uh, amen and amen. <laughs> hey, guys, let's uh, go here. Let's start and look and see what the word of God says. And uh, I can assure you there will be some that love what I say and some that hate what I say. So it just keeps it balanced and God is good. Here we go. Verse 3, or chapter 3, verse 1. And we're going to read 1 through 6, and then we'll go back up and we'll start unfolding it. Wives, likewise. That word likewise, I know I said I'd read it, I can't. I just got to explain it as I go, right? The word likewise literally means, just as we described it uh, earlier, to submit to your authority. And you go, my husband is not my authority. That's a spiritual problem. Uh, because God says that he is. And you're like, I don't already don't like this service. Well, the ushers have locked the door, so you got to sit here through it. And some of you are going to have this sourpuss look on your face like, Pastor, I wish I wouldn't have came, but if I get up and leave now, they're going to know that I didn't like what you had to say. So there you go. There's more pressure. I figure if it's on me, it could be on you too. There you go. Here we go. Wives likewise. Listen, it is a matter of submitting to authority. This is what Peter's talking about. And your husband, wives, is your authority. And I know that you go, I don't like it. I don't agree with it. Tell God when you see him. Take it home and and say, Lord, I didn't like what was said. Because when we look at the scriptures, um, here's the reality. We will either submit to the word of God, or we will submit to our own desires. That, that's just the reality of it, right? And and we're going, oh, man, you know, uh, well, look what's going on. My husband does this. My husband does that. And then if I talk to your husband, he would say, my wife does this and my wife does that. So you guys are both equally just doing whatever you're doing, right? When we look at the scriptures, I'm going to tell you, this is God's design of the home. And if you want your home to operate with God's blessings, then you got to follow God's design. Amen. And so as we look at this, understand God wants what's best for you. And then you got to decide if you want what's best for you. That this is what it's going to come down to. Uh, because I'm, I know I'm looking out and as I'm looking out, I see some of you ladies going, yeah, go ahead, pastor, say some more. I'm glad you want more. Here we go. Wives, likewise, just like we talked about submitting to the government, submitting to the authorities uh, that are over us, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. Ladies, you, as you've already figured out in life, have a lot of power over your husband, if you will. As a matter of fact, the Bible says if you live the way God wants you to live, then you can win your husband. This isn't just winning them to to Christ if they're not saved. But listen, you can win your husband and you can win his love and his affection. What happens in the house is the wife wants what she wants, the husband wants what he wants, and then neither get what they want. Because everybody's so busy trying to get their own agenda. And this is on a spiritual matter. So when we, when we look at this, it's submit to your own husbands so that they, without a word, by your very actions, will win them uh, and, and it, it, you'll get what you want. Verse 2, when they, observe, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be hidden 
Let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. So let's look at this. You know, in in the same way, um, in verse 1, be submissive to your own husbands, that even some uh, obey the word without a word, maybe one with the conduct, conduct of their wives. The wives, likewise, is literally in the same way. In the same way as verse 1, uh, I mean, on verse 7, when it talks about the husbands, husbands, likewise. It's literally in the same way that you are to submit to God. It's a full-on surrender. When we decide we're going to surrender to the Lord, it will change everything. So wives, listen, even though it says submit to your own husbands, you're not to be in subjection like slaves, right? In other words, you're not their property. Well, you are their property and they're your property, right? I mean, husbands and wives, we're we're one another's property, if you will, right? But you're not to be, you're not slaves. God's not asking you to be, uh, to let them be your slave driver and you just submit at every whim and surrender at everything because if they're ungodly, you're not to submit. Remember the likewise? Remember last week I talked about the government and how when are we to stop submitting to the government? And it's when the government requires ungodliness from us or expects ungodliness from us. That's when we stop. Ladies, you're not, listen, if your husband wants you to be ungodly, no, you, you draw the line. Well, what if God, what if, well, God says submit, but it's likewise, like we talked about earlier, like we talked about last week, there's that line and God does not expect you to cross the line. So when we look at this, and, and by the way, husbands, oh, I'm going to get to you today. <laughs> I'm going to get to you today, because here's the question. Are you loving your wife the way Christ loved the church? Because I believe that if we love our wives the way Christ loved the church, we'll get the response that we want. And ladies, you'll get what you want. And then you respond the way God told you to be. And guess what you got? You got a happy home. It, it, it takes both. I'm not, I'm not going to stand up here and say, uh, ladies, it's all your fault. Now, it is your fault that we're in a sinful world, but I'm not going to put that on you today. <laughs> if you don't know the Bible, you just got mad. All right, here we go. But you're not to be slaves as a slave where the husband owns you and just commands you and demands you. That's not what this is talking about. And if the husband's right with God, he's going to treat you the way you want to be treated. And if you're right with God, you're going to treat your husband the way he wants to be treated. And then what you're going to have, you're going to have the blessing of God on your home, on your life, with your children, with everything that that goes on. So you're not to be in subjection like slaves, but this is the principle of Christian subjection to God's will. Now, Rules for wives occurs in some other locations. Here we go. Ephesians 5.22. Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. See, we have, we have a, a guy, a direction, if you will. The problem that we have today is so many women, you're caught up and you have been convinced and, and you, nobody in here, obviously, I'm just using you as a general term. Um, but you believe the lives of the world, this feminist, ungodly movement. And it's destroying the home. It's absolutely destroying the home. How are we to submit to our husbands? As you would to the Lord. Surrender to the rightful place that God has called us to be. And with this feminist movement, women are like, I ain't submitting to my husband. I knew we that's not gonna happen. I mean they don't sound like that. I hope not. <laughs> I just can't get real high with my voice. <laughs> I'm not even gonna try now. At any rate, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. So now we have a direction that we need to go in. Do you do you surrender to God? Do, do you surrender to the Lord? 
If you surrender to the Lord, what does that look like? Now follow that under your husband. Unless it's not looking good. Colossians 3.18 Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Same command. 1 Timothy 2.9-15 In like manner also, let the women adorn themselves in modest apparel. So now, and we're going to get, by the way, we're going to get to the dress code. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. What does it look like uh, that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel? We have, we've had so many movements go through our country, amen? I mean, every country has it. There's just a movement that goes through, and it's like, what does it look like to be in modest apparel for women? Well, I'm going to tell you, ladies, here's what it looks like. Uh, I, we should not see anything here. This shouldn't. Guess what? I don't want to see this either. I don't care if you got a tattoo back there. Keep it for your husband. And I don't want to see this. That's not for me. Why show it? Modest apparel, right? That doesn't mean that you can't dress up. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't look nice. You know, my pastor at home used to always say, uh, you know, every barn needs a little paint every now and then to look better. I'm not calling you ladies barns. I'm just saying that's what, that's what my pastor used to say. And, and uh, he hit a home run just like I did. So here we go. In like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing. This isn't saying that you don't dress nice and that you don't wear jewelry, because I got other verses that will say that, you know, I mean, if you go into Ecclesiastes, oh my goodness, he unfolds it and says what his wife looks like and how he loves her. And he talks about how he likes her to dress up and look nice. And, and so we, we need to do that. Amen. Ladies do that. I'm telling you, dress up, but don't make that your, your only goal. Your goal should be that you do it as unto the Lord. Yeah. Go to the next verse but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. See, there was our line right there. It's, it's like, don't make this your whole goal. Like, I got to be looked at. I got to be looked at. I got to be looked at. One of the biggest issues that women have today is they are so insecure with who they are and what they look like. Because society sets this standard that women should look a certain way, and it's just a lie. It's absolutely a lie. One of the things I do appreciate, we got a, a, a I think it was J.C. Penny catalog in in the mail, and in the front of the catalog, or somewhere in the catalog, I was looking through it, um, it had women of all sizes modeling, not just you know five, ten, one hundred and twenty pounds, uh, whatever, all sizes, and I told my wife because we were standing right there, I said, I love to see this because now it gives all women security in their looks instead of just for thinking they need to look a certain way. But the way this is, which is proper for women professing godliness, listen, if you love the Lord, your attire should be that that makes God proud, not that that draws man's eyes. You know, ladies, uh, Oh my goodness, dear Jesus. <laughs> Next verse. <clears throat> Let, oh man, <laughs> go back, go back one verse. <laughs> oh, I love, love, love preaching the next verse. Here we go. Hmm. <laughs> This is where the Lord has a great sense of humor. Let a woman... <laughs> Why do I find this hysterical? Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. Oh, dear God, help us. Next verse. And I... <laughs> Next verse. No, I'm kidding. Let's read it. <laughs> What I find really interesting, and obviously I'm having 
not a whole lot of fun with this. Um, society, back it up one verse, please. Yeah, let a woman learn in silence with all submission. I am finding it that women, oh, men too, I'll get to them, please. Women are lacking self-control because society has told women they don't need to submit to anyone. They're their own woman and do whatever they want. They have the right to do this or to do that. And God says that's not how it works. God says, listen, and one of the issues that was going on here is that women uh, were being, and it, because First Timothy, we have to understand the book, uh, Paul is writing to Timothy telling him, this is how the church should look. This is how the church should be run. And women were trying to take authority that wasn't theirs. And so Paul says, hey, you let, you let a woman learn in silence with all submission. If she has an issue, you tell her to take it to her husband. Next verse. And I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, but to be in silence. Again, this is about the church and how it's designed. But it's also the design of God. It's literally Christ, man, woman, child, goldfish, rats, do uh, dogs, cats, or somewhere way down here. Food chain. And Paul says, listen, women are to be silent in the church because they're trying to usurp authority over the men and it's causing massive issues in the church and we're not going to have it. That, that's what's going on with this. When you look at this, oh, dear Jesus. So, for example, we have lady pastors. It's wrong. And it's not biblical. And if we were to go, we're not. But if we were to go to, to 1 Timothy chapter 3, it makes it very clear that the man is to be in charge in church. And only men can be pastors. 1 Timothy chapter 3, you can read it. It gives the qualifications. Same way with deacons and so on and so forth. But what we have is we have a society where women are convinced they're equal to men. And you're not. In so many ways. And men are not equal to you in so many ways. God made men a certain way to do a certain job. God made ladies a certain way to do a certain job. And if we would fall in line with what God has put on us, we would have an amazing house, amazing society, and amazing church. If the majority of the world heard me preaching this, I would be on the island of Patmos, <laughs> tarred and feathered, all alone. Because to the world today, what I'm teaching is hate speech. To the world today, what I'm teaching is minimizing women. And I'm not minimizing you. I'm just telling you, God made you a certain way to do certain jobs. And God made men a certain way to do certain jobs. And that's what it is. I, I've shared before how, you know, men are waffle heads. We have compartments. And we go in and we have a goal and we fix the compartment and then we move to the next compartment. And you ladies are spaghetti brains. And that's not an insult, but trust me. Man, you can interweave and jump into anything you want at any time and multitask so wonderful. And it's like, I, I, listen, I can step back and watch some of you ladies and just go, man, God, you did good. <laughs> I don't even know how they do that. And then you ladies will expect us, Waffle Heads, to leave a box and jump over here instantly. And we can't do it. I'm just telling you, we can't do it. We're like, no, no, this is our goal. We're going to get it done. And you want to start talking to us because you're a spaghetti brain and you can jump track anytime you want and never derail. 
And we're going, no, we can't do that. But that's how God has designed us. God has designed men goal-oriented, roll in, deal with it, get out. We don't even, we don't even bring emotion in with it. So now, if you ask the world, uh, we, we need to get in touch with our feminine side. And I'm going to tell you this, there are far too men that are way too close to their feminine side. <laughs> far too many men. God didn't design us for that. And you know what, ladies? God designed you to have this emotion and this like when we see when we see a dog, we're like, yeah, that's a dog. Or we see a baby, we're like, yeah, that's a baby. You ladies see it, you're like, oh, that's such a cute puppy. Can I take him home? And we're like, no. Right? That's the difference in us. God has designed us completely different. Why? So that we can complete one another. Balance each other out. And ladies, if all you want to do is be like the men, and men, if all you want to do is be like women, God forbid, <laughs> we're not going to get anything accomplished for the Lord. Can you tell I'm disgusted with men that want to be women and women that want to be men? It's like, man, just take your place. But, but what's happened is women, because of this feminist movement, this, the women's live and oh, oh, what is this women's right movement, right? Was it, was it women's right? Isn't that what it is? Women's rights movement. Is that, is that one of the movements out there? And, and everyone's like, well, women should have rights. You do, but you don't have the right to step out of the bounds of God's design. And men, you don't have the right to step out of the bounds of God's design. We just don't have that right. But yet, I can do what I want. There's no absolute truth or we don't care what God's design is because it doesn't fit our agenda and we cause problems. Verse 13, please. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived. <laughs> but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Remember how I said, women, is your fault where we're at? That's where I got it. You can laugh. It's okay. The whole idea of this, it says, nevertheless, verse 15, nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with what? Self-control. <clears throat> That's what we're lacking today in households. It's absolutely what we're lacking today in households. Everyone has created their own agenda. And children, parents, you're teaching your children to be Worse than you because you're feeding them electronics and you're feeding them computer games and you're feeding them all this stuff that literally the world is programming them to follow the world and not this. And do not be shocked if your children want nothing to do with God, nothing to do with church, nothing to do with anything that's right, and they want to do it their own way. You're doing it your own way. How's that working out? Listen, I'm telling you guys, at some point we're going to have to pull back in and be parents. And if you're in a divided home, okay, you're in a divided home. But pull it back in and be godly parents. We can't fix the past. But we can sure enough start working on what's right now so that we can right the ship. Amen? Women, you have decided that you are more important than men, and you're not. And men, you have decided that you're more important than women, because some of you are going to walk out of here going, did you hear the pastor? He said, no, I didn't. What we need to have is faith, love, holiness, and self-control. I have a question for you. In your house, do you have faith, love, and self-control? How many are warm? Okay, it's just me. If you don't have these four things, and I'm going I'm to ask you to look at yourself and look at your home and look at your marriage and look at all that's going on. 
And only you can answer this question for yourself. Don't look at your spouse and go, see, you're lacking this and you're lacking this and you're lacking this. (laughs) Don't do that. Don't do that. Where's your faith? That's a serious question. Because everything starts with your faith. If you listen, you don't have faith of God, faith in the Bible, faith in the Scriptures, faith to do what God's called us to do, then guess what? You're not going to do it. The, everything begins and ends with your faith. Everything. So you start there. Where is your faith? Is it in God or is it in you? Or do you go, hey, you know what? I love the Bible when it agrees with me. Where's your faith? Do you have love in your house? Are you loving one another as Christ loved you? Are you loving your spouse the way Christ says to love your spouse? Are you doing it your way or God's way? And holiness. What is your walk looking like? Your actions looking like? See, this this is the recipe right here for a successful, godly household. Whether you're a man or a woman, it's immaterial. What is this? Do you have faith? Do you believe Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? If you're not there, listen, the, the Bible, you can practice what it says. That'll benefit you. But do you have faith so that God can come in and bless your house as well? Are you loving one another are your, are your actions holy and do you have self-control? Or have you just made it all about you? That, these are the questions that you legitimately have to ask yourself. And if you're honest and then you're willing to fix it, you very well may take care of a lot of the issues you have in your house. But if you are content and set on being what the world says you should be, do not be shocked when you have struggles. Just don't be shocked. Because I I promise you, you're going to have struggles. It's not going to be good. Go to Titus 2, 4 through 5. That they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, Chaste homemakers. Now that's almost a curse word today. But ladies, let me say this. The absolute most valuable job that you have or could ever have is to be home taking care of your children. To raise them up in the way that God would have them to walk. Our society, and I, listen, this isn't popular, but I already realized when I came here today that I wasn't going to be popular or well-liked. I settled into it. God is good. Amen. He still loves me whether you do or not. The detriment to our society is when women decided to let, and, and men, decided to let daycare raise their children. And some of you are going, I didn't have a choice. Well, praise God then, I'm not talking to you. But some of you have a choice and had a choice. But you wanted the boat, the finer ride, and the bigger house. All in the name of giving your children what you never had. Meanwhile, you robbed them of what you did have. Solid home. Parents in the house. Man, I hate the world. Be discreet. Ladies, that goes back to the apparel. Nobody, nobody needs to see your cleavage. Nobody. I watch UFC, and there's a lot of, uh, they have a lot of lady hosts on there now, right? Commentators or lady commentators. And I comment almost all the time to my wife when those commentators come on. 
because they always wear clothing up to here. They're beautiful women. But they dress like beautiful women, classy. They're, they're not out trying to show themselves. They're not out trying to get attention. They're not out trying to get another man to look at them. They're just there to do a job. And I always compliment, uh, tell my wife, I'm like, look, she's dressed so classy. It's just appreciated. Because what happens is, ladies, if you dress appropriate, Men aren't going to look at you, especially in the wrong way. And you got to be secure with that. Which means, men, you've got to make your wives feel beautiful and loved. But then that means, ladies, you got to take care of yourselves too. Like this is a whole realm of everything. And, and for some reason, in, in, in relationships, and America is just known for this. That we are, we never do this. We, we never swing the pendulum and go, okay, let's just balance this out. No, 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 no. Americans can't do that. We're either bam or bam. I mean, we don't, it's like, what just happened? There was a school in, Ma I think it was Massachusetts, Connecticut, one of these uh, uh, liberal crazy states. And so um, th uh, a student went in and made a, a, a blow up pen and it didn't hurt anyone it just made a loud crack and, and scared the teacher right it was a push pen and so the school goes that's it no more pens allowed in school pencils only why don't you just suspend the kid no 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 we got to punish everyone oh we can't use red pen to grade papers anymore because it'll destroy their their psyche because red pen just makes them look so bad. It's like, really? Like we we can't we can't and marriages or 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 homes are getting about the same way. Uh where husband and wife, you need to get on the same page with your children. My kids knew, boy, mm, if I said no, or if mom said no, and that child tried to play the two parents. It was borderline funeral. I mean, my kids understood. I don't care what parent answered. That was the answer. Now, you're not happy with it? You want to discuss it? Bring us together. And together we'll talk about it and maybe we'll see if we can move the pendulum, right? You don't play one toward the other. And then the parents fight. Mom's like, I told him he could, or dad's like, I told him he could, or I told him he couldn't. And then we got a fight in the house and the kid's doing whatever he wants. I'm just saying, guys, we gotta we gotta bring these homes together, be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands. You're not required, ladies, to listen to every man, just your husband. That the word of God may not be blasphemed. That word blasphemed is made fun of. And right now, what does the world do with the word of God? It's, it's made fun of. It's blasphemed. It's mocked. Because Christians, oh, we believe in God, but we don't believe in the way God says to do things. Because that just doesn't settle with our soul well. We want what we want. Go to, um, pull up 1 Samuel 16, 7. Ladies, if you live your life appropriate in the way it's supposed to be, then the husband observes your purity of life. And then the intended manner of, of life for wives, you realize becomes inward, and you're right with God inward, then the outward uh, shows itself. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. This right here is Saul. It's about King Saul. And the idea of this verse is God doesn't, God doesn't look at, at people the way we look at people, right? Um, let's just be honest. If, if, uh, if you, we, we judge people by their looks, we judge people by 
their size, we judge people by their actions, we judge people by um, so many things that just, how many times have you ever judged someone and then you got to know them and you went, boy, I was so wrong. Right? Because what do we do? We look at someone and we immediately make a judgment. Immediately make a judgment. God says, I don't do that. I don't, look, I don't look. I don't look at his appearance or at his physical stature. Appearance means the way they're dressed or the way they present themselves. Physical stature is the way they carry themselves. God says, I don't look at that because I've refused Saul, is who he's talking about. For the Lord does not see as man sees, that's humanity. For man looks at the outward appearance, of, but the Lord looks at the heart. Man, if we would just slow the boat and start looking at people for who they are, instead of judging them the way we think they are, or looking at them the way the world says that we need to look at them, a whole lot would change, amen? A whole lot would change. And so God says, listen, I, I need you to look at the heart. And ladies, um, in this passage, or this process that we're looking at, and men, it fits to you as well, adjust yourself so that the Lord sees your heart. It doesn't matter what you look like. Now, that being said, it does matter that you take care of yourselves. It does matter that you make yourselves presentable, uh, especially if you have a husband. Because I'm going to tell you, man, if you walk around and you got your your pajamas on all the time and you got a beer in this hand and a cigarette in this hand and you keep your teeth out, you know, it's like it's going to be a struggle. Dear God. <laughs> And your hair all up to here in curls. <laughs> I know nobody in here does that. I pray nobody in here does that. <laughs> I went to a friend of mine's house one time. This is when I lived in the South. I had just moved there. And um, <laughs> true story. Not even, I'm not even, like, I don't even need to exaggerate this one. So his name was Billy. I worked with him. Uh, he was an older gentleman. I go to his house. I got to drop some stuff off to him. He needed any rate. So I knock on the door and his wife answered the phone or the, the door. <laughs> I wish it had been a phone. <laughs> <laughs> so she comes to the door. I'm telling you, I am not exaggerating. She's got a big old wad of chewing tobacco in. <laughs> she didn't bring a cup with her either. Just put, put that out there. Had a little bit of coming on her right here on each side of the mouth. She had her hair, her bangs, duct taped to her forehead. God is my witness, I'm telling you, duct tape. I'm not, like, I'm not kidding. I don't know if she didn't want the hair anymore. Or if that was her line to cut, because you know when she pulled that duct tape off, everything's coming. But she had this strip, <laughs> this strip of duct tape with her bands, her uh, uh, bangs pulled down. I'm not even going to the clothing. It was, it was atrocious at best. She comes to the door, and she's southern. Joan. What you don't hear? And I'm not kidding. That's how she talked. Backwards, deep, deep woods, southern. I said, well, I came over to see Billy. Now, mind you, I'm in the door because she opened this, the, the door, right? And she, she took her arm, put it on my shoulder, and she did this. Well, Billy be out in a minute. I go get him. I went, oh, dear Jesus. <laughs> she disappeared. Billy comes out. And I immediately just looked at him and started praying for him. <laughs> Not kidding. Right? But ladies, ladies, you, you need to take care of yourselves. Men, you need to take care of yourselves. Listen, you don't need to have a belly out to here and a t-shirt to here. You know what I'm saying? Like, like we don't need to do this. And and you don't need to be you don't need to be nine hundred pounds wearing a tank top because you're not Mr. Olympia, right? Like, I mean, we, we dress appropriately and we carry ourselves appropriately. We need to make ourselves attractive for one another. Amen? Okay, maybe not. <laughs> I'm, I'm, trying to help, I'm trying to help all of y'all out. Ain't none of you. 
Oh, I know you're still mad at me from wives submit to your husbands, aren't you? And men, don't be scared. Say amen. And now there you're like, uh-uh, you ain't getting me in on this one. Yeah, thanks. I'll take the bullet. Here we go. Um, oh, my goodness. So listen, I want you to see, though, that, that when God looks, God is looking at the heart. And Peter also is talking about the heart and the attitude that we have and how we should live, how we should we walk and how we should act and how we should treat one another. And, and ladies, uh, don't, you don't dress to go out to draw attention from the world. Just don't do it. Don't do it. And, and husbands, if you love your wives the way Christ said to love your wife, guess what? Your wife won't go out trying to get attention from other men. You just won't do it. It's probably my least amen sermon I've ever had. Here we go. <laughs> when we look at the heart, when we look at the heart, it's literally, uh, it is the core of who we are as, when Scripture talks about it, right? And so we are to, our inner self literally is the heart or the person of the heart and the character of the person. Proverbs 3, 5 says this, Trust in the Lord with everything you are. With everything you are. Trust in the Lord with everything you are. Not just on Sundays, not partial, but trust in the Lord with everything you are and lean not on your own understanding. Verse, uh, um, and then six, which I didn't give you, but Christ will direct your... Oh, dude, you are, I'm going to give you a raise. We're going to order a taller chair. Here we go. And all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. The whole idea is if you surrender to God with all of your inner, all of who you are, everything you are, man or woman, then God will direct your paths. But that's a promise, by the way. That's not just a, uh, a, a passage to throw out there or a suggestion. That's literally a promise. Go to Proverbs 4.23. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. If your heart is set and focused on God, all of your issues go away. Does that mean you'll never have a problem? I wish. What it means is a problem will never have you. If you do this, all of your relationships will settle. They'll be good. And if they're not good, it's still going to be good. Why? Because you're with the Lord. You're holding on to the Lord. But the promise is that if you keep your heart with all diligence, the issues of life, the issues you have will be minimized. I love when I hear men complain about their wives and wives complain about their husbands and so on and so forth. And I sit and I look and then I'll start asking some questions. And then what I find is somebody's just being ungodly to the core and you're not willing to adjust. And then all of a sudden it's your spouse's problem because, well, that's the problem. And I'm not, listen, some of you are, are in, in relationships that you're doing all you can and you've done all you can and your spouse legitimately is the problem. Spouse, you need to fix it. Ladies, you have the power. Remember in 3-1, you have the power to change your husband for good. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. And what we find is characteristic of the wife and the husband is we don't fall back to the word of God we fall back to spurning one another, right? Oh, well, I don't like you doing this, so I'm going to do this, and I'm just going to make your life a living torment rather than just hit our knees and stay there. And I'm just going to tell you, I don't know about you, but if someone were to pick a fight with me and I were to poke back, Guess what I would do? I would keep the fight going. And some of you, 
you just keep the fight going. And then complain that your household is a wreck. It'll stay a wreck. You can't do it your way and expect it to look like God says it'll look. Husbands, control your tongue and your actions. Wives, do the same. This isn't about you. This is about the Lord and us honoring God. And if we and by, and by the way, mom, dad, the way you treat one another will teach your children to treat their future spouse the same way. The same way. Mom, if you think you're in control of that house and you're abusive to your husband or neglectful to your husband or bossy to your husband or disrespectful to your husband, oh, don't be shocked if your children are the same way, if your daughter does the exact same thing. Dad, if you are abusive to your wife verbally or physically, don't be stunned if your boys grow up to be the same way. They will watch you and they will emulate you. Not even because they want to, but because they fall back on what they have been taught and what they've always seen. And then guess what you've done? You took that to another house, which will go to another house and then another house until somebody breaks the generational curse. If you don't show any love, don't be surprised your children don't show any love. If you show favoritism, don't be surprised if your children are out of balance. Don't be shocked. Don't be shocked if your children's house looks just like your house. Don't be stunned. Because it's exactly what will happen. I will also tell you this. Most guys marry those that are like their mother and most girls marry those that are like their father. Are you being the man or the woman that you would be pleased with if your child marries? Guys, I'm just going to tell you, homes are in a wreck because mo today most parents are in a wreck. We believe the, the world because the world has it so much more fun and exciting or we think we're missing something. The only thing we're missing is God if we're living any other way. That's all we're missing. You know, one of the things that my dad taught me was what kind of father I didn't want to be. Man, I'm telling you. And when I when we first had children, I set out to not be like my dad. Then as they got older and it was time to discipline, I discovered in here, I didn't act it out. Uh, a couple of times I, I punished my children the way I was punished. And then one day I saw in my youngest daughter's eyes uh, the hurt and the pain that I had caused her. And I vowed from that day on to never punish my children or to be my father again. And it took great exercise because Instinct tells me to do what I was taught or what I saw, right? Isn't that what we do? Amen? So it took a great deal of effort for me and, and my, so, uh, and they were young. They were both uh, young, probably um, six or seven at the time. And I said, okay, I'm, ne I'm not going to be my dad. I'm just not. I want my children to know that I love them and that I'm there for them and that they can trust me and they can talk to me. And if they have a problem, 
that they can come to me. That was so important. And so then I had to make adjustments. And then you always wonder sometimes, like, did we make the right adjustment? Did we, did we do this thing right? And I still don't, obviously I didn't do everything right raising my children. I, I did what, what, I, what was best. But one of the moments where, because so let's be honest, right? Uh, children always call mom. <laughs> uh, they always call dad when they need something fixed or taken care of or money or, you know. But one day, uh, so Tori played volleyball and she was in uh, eighth grade modified. And she was having a hard day. And the game didn't go well, and she's so hard on herself. I'm telling you, she's a fantastic volleyball player. And I always tell her I'm her biggest fan, and I am. I'm legitimately, I am her biggest fan. And she's amazing on the court, and um, she's got great leadership uh, ability and skills, and she was captain of the team uh, in college and a co-captain in high school. And uh, I swear, when you when you see her go on the court, the whole team changes. Like all of a sudden there's this energy that wasn't there when she was sitting on the bench. And since she's only five, two, she couldn't run the front line. So she was set on the bench when, when it would be her rotation on the front line. At any rate, one day she's having a huge uh, struggle and it was down here at golf and the game was over and they were putting everything away. And Sherry and I, we were up in the stands sitting and then, uh, uh as we always do, we came out of the stands. We were walking across the court. And she had a bad game. Not a horrible game, but for her, a bad game is a horrible game. <laughs> and Sherry and I are walking side by side toward her. And she got from me to you, Daryl. And all of a sudden, I could see her chin quivering and her eyes tearing up. <clears throat> And Sherry and I are side by side walking toward her. And she just ran into my chest, wrapped her arms around me. And of course, I just held her and I was like, hey, sweetie, it's okay. What's going on? And she just cried and I just let her cry and she worked through it. And for a dad, that was the most amazing moment for me. Not because my daughter is crying, but because my daughter knew she could run into my arms. And I would just hold her and love her and not tell her, well, next time you'll do better or whatever. I'm like, hey, you know what, sweetie? Man, everybody has a bad day and everybody has a bad game. And you'll be all right. You'll learn and you'll be strengthened and you'll move on. Next week, you'll hit home runs. And we just loved on each other right in the middle of the court. And at that moment, I knew my decision years earlier to make sure that I tried to be the dad. I'm not perfect. I promise you, ask them, they'll tell you. But from that moment, I knew that if I didn't make the adjustments in my kid's life, I was, they were going to look at me the way I looked at my dad, and I didn't want that. And so what I'm trying to tell you is, if you're not doing it God's way, as a wife, as a husband, as a man, as a woman, Adjust it. Adjust it. Break the curse if there was one in your family. And if it wasn't one in your family and it was great, then keep it great. But if we don't do it God's way, we're going to have massive, massive struggles. They're not going to go away. It's not going to be any different. And we're going to, we're going to, we're going to just we're going to keep repeating history and teaching the world that the church is no different. And I can assure you, we are different. But it's going to take a conscious decision. The conscious decision is don't make decisions based on what you want. Make them based on what God says. Love your children the way God says to love your children, not the way you were brought up. 
Love your spouse the way God says to love your spouse. Ladies, set the example. Men are hard-headed. That's why, as ladies, you live it out and men will learn. <laughs> There's this whole realm of expectations that God says if we live it out will change everything, but not just our household. It will change our children, which will change their household, which will change their children and their household, and it will just keep going on and on. I'm going to jump down to verse 7, and I'm going to spend just a second on verse 7. And I know, boy, I, I, this was two sermons, but for lack of time, I, I didn't have the time to do that. Verse 7, husbands likewise. Likewise is the same word as we saw in others that we just, we are to submit the, in the way God tells us to submit. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding. Oh, dear Jesus. How do you understand a woman? You know, there was a guy who prayed to the Lord and said, Lord, I need you to answer a prayer. And God says, man, listen, anything you want, because you have lived a life, you ask any question you want, and I'll take care of it. And the guy says, well, there's two things that I really want. The first thing I want is I want a bridge from the States to Hawaii so I can drive across anytime I want. And God's like, you know what it would take to do that? That's crazy. Give me, what's your second one? God, I want to understand women. God says, you want that bridge one lane or two? <laughs> Likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as the weaker vessel, not the less than vessel, as the weaker vessel. Men, you are designed to take care of your household, protect your household, to supply your household. That's the way God built us. That's the way God wants us. Your wife isn't weaker because she's less than. Your wife is weaker in the respects that we love her, we adore her, we take care of her, and we want to make sure she's safe and provided for. That's, that's what the men should do. And ladies, if you don't allow your husband to do that, or you keep demanding more and more and more and more from him, here's what you do. You start destroying him. And then he can't give you anything you want, and he's not going to be what God wants. Take the pressure off of him. Be satisfied. Respect him. Because ladies, if you don't respect your man, that's all we ask for. I'm going to tell you right up front. All we ask for is respect. If you disrespect us, we disconnect. And you say, well, he ain't earning it. Well, honey, with an attitude like that, you're not earning honor either. That's all I'm saying. Respect your husband. Husband, earn it. And then husbands, honor your wife. What does it mean to honor your wife? As the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that, through your, that, that your prayers may not be hindered. Honor your wife literally means to love her, cherish her, and take care of her needs. Love her, cherish her, take care of her needs. That's physically as well. If you're not taking care of your husband, and husband, if you're not honoring her, your house is going to be divided. And you're not doing it God's way. Honor your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. Take care of one another. Nourish and cherish one another. And we need to do it as Christ gave himself up for the church, Ephesians 5, 25 through 28. And I'm going to rush through this because I think we need it. Ephesians 5, 28, 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Guys, what did Christ do for the church? The church being us, the people. He died for us. Nothing got in the way. He was there. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I will be there. I will take care of your needs. I will love you. I will cherish you. I will take care of you. Uh, and he gave himself for her, verse 26. 
that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. 27. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Uh, So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Listen, I'm telling you, man, you love your wife. Husbands, love your wives. If you love your wife like Christ loved the church, your wife will be so content in who she is. She'll absolutely be content in who she is and who God made her. Husbands, you, you have to love your wives as your church. And then ladies, you have to. You have to let him. Quit looking at other men wanting your husband to be that because he's not. The street runs both ways. Let's take work for both. But if you don't do your share, the other share is going to fall apart. Proverbs uh, 5, 18 through 19. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. As a loving deer and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her love. Ladies, you have to let him love you, but men, you have to love her. I don't care where you go in the world, whether it's walking down the mall, whether it's on TV or on the computer, uh, porn jumps up everywhere. And and by the way, porn isn't just the erotica porn that, that people uh, typically think of. Uh, porn is anything seducing. Walk down the mall uh, and look at some of these stores that are selling um, uh, apparel, right? And they have all these seducing pictures. Half of them aren't even dressing mannequins anymore. What do you think children are seeing? What's it doing? It's constantly poisoning the brain. And we need to stop and stay focused on our loved ones. 1 Corinthians 7, 3-5. through five. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise the wife to her husband. Husbands, if you don't do your job, Wives are going to look, and wives, if you don't do your job, husbands are going to look. It is what it is. It doesn't change. It doesn't change. That's just natural. Render due to each one. Look here in verse 4. The wife does not have authority over her own body. Now, that's contrary to the world, right? It's my body, my choice. Until it comes to the vaccine, then it ain't nobody's choice. All right, that was unnecessary. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. You both are obligated and committed in this relationship to share your body with one another. In marriage. A lot of women, you'd like to use it as a tool. And all it does is cause contention and dissension and fights and arguments and and division. Listen, if you don't do this, guess what ain't happening? And it won't be long before the husband's like, fine. And then you're not getting loved the way you want to be loved. And your marriage will start crumbling. And men, you have no right to do that either. It's destructive. And it's horrible. And it forces people to go elsewhere. Verse 5. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. The church is not the world. And therefore, we should not act like it. The scriptures are clear. 
If you're struggling in these areas, make the adjustments. And if you don't, do not be shocked that your spouse is not what you want them to be. Don't be shocked. And then don't be stunned if your children grow up to be just like you. How do we fix it? We start today. We start today. Every day is a new day, a fresh start. So if you haven't been doing what's right, start today. If your children look at you and go, I ain't never seen you do that before, tell them. Because I was wrong. And I decided to do it God's way instead of my way. Let me encourage you to do the same. Just fix it and move on. You got a whole bunch of guilt? Let it go. God says, give it to me and I will deliver you. I will forgive you. I'll cast it as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered again. I'll throw it in the deepest part of the sea, never to be retrieved again. But if you don't start making changes soon, don't expect anything to change. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I need, I need to make some changes. Will you pray for me? Raise your hand. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Pastor, I need to make changes. Will you raise your hand so I can see you? Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come before you, and Father, today in society, relationships seem to be so messed up. Everyone seems to be out for themselves. and I don't know. Sometimes I think we just lose sight. Sometimes we just get caught up in us. Father, right now, for those who raise their hand, I just pray that you would touch them. Father, I pray that whatever it is they're struggling with on, on their end, that, that you help them fix it, give them the strength to do what is right. And Father, if it's their spouse, Father, I pray that you would do amazing things in that. Father, if the ladies need to adjust, I pray, Father, that you would give them the strength and the clarity to make the adjustments. And likewise for the men. Lord, that we may honor you in all things. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, remember the first thing we talked about was faith. It's going to be real hard to do it God's way if you don't know God. So we're going to be real hard to have the power of God on your hand, on your life, on your actions, and to make changes if you don't know him. God says that he does not hear the prayers of the lost. And so if it's your desire to surrender your life to Christ and start with faith, then I want you to pray this prayer. Not because the prayer is magical. There's nothing magical about the words. It's in your heart. Remember that everything that you are that we talked about in Scripture, with all of your heart, you're surrendering your life to Christ. You're believing on Jesus as your Lord and Savior, which means that at that point you're adopted into the family and you become a child of God. Then you get the power of God on your life and you get the gift of heaven when you should pass. And it's the exact opposite if you don't have Christ. If it's your desire to surrender to the Lord, pray this prayer quietly to yourself. Father in heaven, Today I surrender. I surrender everything to you. Today I believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. I believe he is the only way to heaven. And so, Father, I ask that you forgive me of all my sins. Wash me white as snow. And today 
I surrender to Jesus Christ and make him Lord in my life. We at Connecting Point Church are excited to have you join us. When you come, you'll experience a friendly, lively, and casual family-like atmosphere that welcomes you as you are. Our messages combine straightforward biblical truths, humor, and life-changing challenges for you to learn and grow in God's Word. We believe in connecting people to Christ, to the plans and gifts He has for them, and with people in our community who share these values. We also believe in reaching out to our local area and the regions beyond. We're dedicated to being a place where your entire family can believe, belong, and become all that God intends you to be. Discover the abundance of life in Jesus Christ as you begin to understand the roots of the problems and learn to apply the tools for you to triumph over your challenges today. It'll be a breath of fresh air in this unsettled world. 